So the goals of the webinar today are going to be discussing the basics of fire risk assessment. So I will be going into a little bit about fire behavior. Um, we're going to cover a checklist of pre-fire plan components and then talk about a little bit towards the end about how to share this information and who to share it with. Um, and I will apologize at the beginning. Most of what I'm going to talk about today is uh, going to be focused on kind of Hawaii and the Pacific, but it should be the generalizable to a different, different ecosystems as well. Um, so when we talk about wildfire threat, what we're really discussing here is this combination of our values at risk and then the Sorry, and then the exposure that those um, assets have to wildfire danger. So, you know, uh, a lot of folks are interested in trying to figure out what is the risk of wildfire occurrence, um, and that's really only half of the equation, right? And again, this is where land manager knowledge becomes really critical because um, it's really in the hands of the land managers to identify those resources that they value. And so it's the combination of these two pieces, and we can rank this sort of across our land management units um, based on sort of high value assets in high risk areas all the way down to low value assets in low risk areas. So it, it takes um, these two pieces to really get at how we prioritize um, assets and mitigation measures across the landscape. Um, and so as I said, I'll start a little bit with the fire environment here. Um, I like this sort of model for fire currents and an ecosystem. You basically, it's a pretty simple recipe. You need an ignition source. Um, the vast majority of our fires in Hawaii and on other Pacific islands are started by people, about like over 99%. Um, lightning strikes are relatively rare. Um, uh, you need vegetation, so in a fire science perspective, vegetation is just fuels, it's everything that can burn, and so different characteristics of the vegetation make them more prone to burning. So in this picture here, you can see a nice thick layer of guinea grass in an old agricultural field, which is a pretty common site here in Hawaii. Um, and so these fine fuels like grasses burn very easily and ignite very easily. And then the right climate. Um, so not too wet, not too dry, um, and the seasonality especially will affect fire currents. Um, it gets much more complicated than this. As we probably all know, once a fire is happening, you get into this fire behavior triangle where topography, sort of weather in the moment, um, in addition to the fuel types, play a role in determining how fire will move across the landscape. And then as fires repeat themselves over time, we get to what in fire ecology we refer to as the fire regime, which is just sort of how we characterize these basic characteristics of fire occurrence uh, in a given area. And for Hawaii, again, our, our issues here, what we've been seeing is an increase in human caused ignitions. Uh, on the ignition side of things, we also get the uh, expansion of grasslands. So we're seeing our kind of landscapes become more flammable um, around us, as, especially as agricultural and ranching decline statewide. Um, and then drought, sort of, we know that wildfire occurrence, large fires at least, are associated with drought. We've already seen. Uh, three fires over a thousand acres this year and we're not even into our summer months so um, we'll get to that in a, in a second here and so this is kind of the patterns we're seeing this is about since 1989 the fire history here and statewide uh, Hawaii wildfire management organization our partners put these data together from multiple agencies and we just see that they're abundant we're getting seen fires all the time um, and if you're interested in more details about this check out uh, the PFX website we've got a uh, a fact sheet on wildfire currents in Hawaii. Um, the other thing I like about this model for understanding fire is it allows us to understand what we can target, what can we manage to reduce this risk. Um, you know, climate's kind of out of the out of our hands, um, but human caused ignitions and vegetation um, are a little bit more tractable as far as managing. Um, like I said, climate and weather, we know that fire is tied to drought in Hawaii. Um, and we can kind of keep eyes on this and sort of for us as land managers or those of you as land managers to understand when fire risk is higher. Um, this is a Keech Byram drought index that the National Weather Service uses for Hawaii to kind of track fire conditions. This green line is sort of our average conditions. Um, so typically, 
and then you know the higher this is, this uh, into that yellow zone is indicating drought. Typically, this time of year, we're kind of down lower in the not in drought conditions, and you can see that blue line is what's happening now. Uh, we're following the sort of typical El Nino pattern with a very dry winter, followed uh, by following a wet summer. So fire risk is high in general out there right now. And then the red flag sort of on a daily weather basis, what we're really after is the big things in Hawaii are wind and relative humidity. So high winds, our temperature doesn't vary that much. It's pretty much always warm and sunny here. But uh, high, winds, high winds, low relative humidity are kind of the red flags uh, for high fire danger. Topography also plays a big role. Um, so this is sort of understanding the fire environment, trying to get your head around the place that you're thinking about um, as a land manager. Fire moves faster uphill. Um, south facing aspects that tend to be drier um, will burn more intensely and, and potentially faster. And then elevation, there's a pretty strong relationships in Hawaii between um, moisture primarily. So higher elevations tend to be moister than lower elevations, uh, which can reduce fire risk to some extent. And then ignitions, as I said, we are primarily driven by human cause ignitions statewide. This little figure down in the corner there shows the number of fires, total number of fires um, as a function of population per island. And so you can see it's a pretty tight relationship there. You know, on Oahu here where I live, we average about five to 600 ignitions per year. Most of them are small, but uh, you know, each year we tend to get some, some large fires. And as many of you may be aware, we just had one a week and a half ago. It burned 2,500 acres on the west side. And you know, ignitions are a tough one um, because it's hard to control human behavior, but we can, as land managers, do things like limiting access, and kind of just understanding you know, who is using these areas and, and try to increase awareness um, about fire danger and fire risk, especially when the, the conditions are uh, indicative that fire danger is high. Um, and you can see we've mapped these sort of, again, with uh, using Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization's data. Um, and this really just shows that we, we've, pretty got, we've got pretty high risk kind of on both the leeward, our drier sides of the island, as well as the windward, the east side. So we, we get high ignitions um, pretty much wherever people are in the, in the islands. And ultimately, vegetation is the only thing that we can directly manipulate, directly control. Um, and so for as far as fire occurrence and, and fire behavior, these are the things that I think, again, where local knowledge comes in really handy. And a lot of this. Uh, is pretty common sense. I mean, I think that for those of us that have a pretty good familiarity with plants and the sort of forests and grassland structure, it, it, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's hard to predict where fire is going to go, but the things that we're really interested in understanding here and are indicative of risk are these surface fuels, which are grasses, so those fine fuels that will allow fires to carry across um, or horiz move horizontally across the landscape. Um, and then, of course, these latter fuels, which are the shrubbier, woodier vegetation, which can allow um, fires to move vertically up into tree canopies. Um, and so these are sort of the, the, the basic components from a fuels perspective that, that you're looking for. And we know in Hawaii, um, we are sort of surrounded by a really altered landscape. And this is from the Honolulu Zoo. That's my daughter there. But we, we don't really have to go to the zoo to talk about African savannas because we actually live in these ecosystems nowadays that are very analogous to these savannas where you get these mixes of grasses and shrubs. Uh, and these are the kinds of fuels that, like I said, carry fires horizontally across the landscape um, very quickly. Um, it can be very dangerous from a fire suppression perspective. Um, and then interspersed with a lot of these non-native uh, woody species. This here is Chiave in this picture. Uh, the slide before was uh, a, a big stand of eucalyptus. Um, and these areas, they, they, like I said, they're very prone to burning. Um, and they cause some pretty big issues for our suppression, wildfire suppression folks. This is the most recent fire we just had in Nanakuli. So this kind of, these ecosystems burn very easily. You can see in this slide that that whole back rim of that valley was 
pretty much pure buffalo grass and guinea grass and the fire ran up straight to the top of the mountain um, and a buddy of mine who was up on the ridge sort of from where this picture was taken from said he watched it burn from the bottom of that <laughs> to the top in about three minutes so so it's it there it can be incredibly tricky uh, to manage but sort of being aware of these larger landscapes as, uh, drivers of fire really is what allows us to start categorizing our our the assets that we're worried about and sort of on this risk continuum of you know which where is the risk highest and where is the exposure to these uh, assets that I'm interested highest and and so the next part of this talk is really going to be moving into this idea of you know, what are the components as a land manager, the knowledge that I, I probably already possess about your area, um, and, and what are the kind of things that you should be keeping in mind to integrate into a good, into a good pre-fire plan. Um, highest priority, of course, is people. In any scenario, um, humans will have, <laughs> human safety is number one. And uh, it's important to just keep this in mind, especially for interacting with firefighters, is that the, the human safety will always be the number one priority, as it should be. Um, but from working with people that work and or live on your landscape, um, you know, this is where we want to talk about evacuation routes. Um, communication chains, so text or phone chains, so in the event that emergency happens, um, you know, how can you let everybody know what's going on and make sure that everyone is either evacuating or is in a safe place. Um, livestock and pets kind of fall into this category as well, um, so we can talk about uh, making sure there's a plan to evacuate animals if they're on the on the site, um, making sure that they're not stuck. and safety zones as well so you know do people have a uh, know where these places are to go where they can be safe and safety zone establishment gets a little bit technical as far as what constitutes a safety zone um, and if you're interested in determining what can serve as a safety zone on your landscape um, you know I encourage you to contact me or contact your local fire department uh, to discuss that but basically getting this plan in place making sure everyone that's involved knows the plan and as we'll get sort of returned to a little bit further in the, this talk is uh, making that information accessible um, so that's easily to understand and then discussing the plan with with your local fire agencies is, is really really important so that they're familiar with your needs and with your with your land um, as well as you becoming familiar with their needs uh, Infrastructure tends to be ranked next after people. Um, one of the important things to consider is fire vehicle access. We often see in a lot of these, uh, well, especially even neighborhoods, but also on, on land holdings where you know fires, fire vehicles might be able to sort of access one side of the property around the structure, but not really be able to get to the back side. So just thinking about how fire vehicles can get in and around structures on your land. And then this idea of defensible space. This is this figure that I'm showing is kind of classic firewise community stuff where, you know, having 50 to 100 feet of cleared area around structures. And this just provides uh, firefighters um, a chance, the opportunity to, to protect your structure. And then there's lots of things that you can do uh, as far as construction is concerned to harden your homes. Um, so one of the big ones is clearing litter and debris from roof and siding, putting vents, or sorry, screens over your vents, um, and then using fire resistant materials for roofing and things like that. They've shown that majority of structure that are consumed during wildfires happen from embers landing on the structure. So it's not direct contact where the fire actually moves up, it's from embers flying in. So these things can actually make a pretty big difference um, when it comes to saving infrastructure. And then making sure you remove all the, these combustible materials like propane and gas tanks. Don't have them under the structures or out on the knives in the, on your deck. Um, and so when we're compiling this information, also it's a good thing to keep in mind and sort of indicate is where the structures are and also where utilities such as power and gas lines are on the landscape. And this is when you're sort of transferring, uh, informing your fire response agencies. Other valued resources, um, a lot of us here in Hawaii uh, work with 
critically endangered species. Um, we've, we're actually kind of the capital in the nation for, I think we've got about over 40% of the endangered plants, at least. I don't know about what the situation is for birds and whatnot, but for we have high, high densities of, of critically endangered species. And so this is often on people's minds, um, but also cultural sites uh, in certain circumstances, crops, um, forage for, for uh, agricultural production. These resources are important. They are might have a lower priority than, than human lives, of course, but they um, are often, uh, it's totally valid to communicate the location of these things to firefighters. They will try to protect these areas when it's possible and when it's not endangering um, people. And so it's really uh, critical to sort of indicate where these places are on maps that can get pretty sensitive with uh, endangered species, for example, putting specific locations, but at least areas of critical habitat. Um, and then uh, at the federal level, uh, a lot of agencies will actually appoint a resource advisor. So this would be someone who knows the locations of these um, types of resources and will be on scene at the fire, interacting with incident commander to sort of make sure that they know where these areas are. Uh, we talked about vegetation a little bit in the sense of um, what drives fire occurrence. And the reason this is important is because you can indicate where these hazardous fuels are. Um, so if you know that there are problematic areas, that's something that you can indicate in your plan. It's also really critical if you have existing fire breaks or areas where you've done fuel reductions. Um, that can be really critical information for fire responders to know. Um, it may provide them a place to actually defend areas or try to um, stop the spread of a fire. Um, these, this kind of information also becomes critical when you sort of move into risk mitigation because this is where you're going to target potential actions to reduce fire risk, right? So, so once you get your head around where these hazards are relative to the resources that you're interested in protecting, you can start developing a plan potentially um, to reduce that risk by managing the fuels. And there are lots of ways. Sorry about that. My uh, my microphone just popped out. Um, there are lots of ways to reduce fuels, reduce fire hazard, and it's really uh, the discussion for the, another uh, webinar. But really, the the purpose here is to reduce the qu quantity and especially the continuity. We talked about that continuity sort of horizontally across the landscape, vertically up into trees. Um, fuel continuity is really important. So fire breaks and fuel breaks um, that can use mechanical removal, herbicide, or grazing. Um, in Hawaii, we've been working a lot on shaded fuel breaks or, or green strips. And even prescribed fire, I just uh, I think last week or two weeks ago, they did some prescribed burns over on Maui to reduce fuel and fire risk um, over in West Maui. So these, th these practices are all um, used uh, in Hawaii and elsewhere in the Pacific as well. Communication is something that can often be overlooked. Um, so this is from a general sense, I guess the most important thing is communicating your needs and um, to your, your plan to the relevant fire response agencies. And we have these response maps for Hawaii State at least that indicate which agencies are responsible for which areas. So I encourage you to um, check those out and the link is provided in the guide that's posted on our website so you can look at those maps but just to see where you fall within that uh within these response these jurisdictions again we talked about residents and neighbors so people that may be adjacent to your land or living and working on on the land management unit you're you're dealing with um, how do you uh, communicate to them if an incident is actually happening and then another thing for larger landscapes, uh, it's important to, you can map coverage. So is there, you know, dead zones and cellular reception or radio? Um, and I know, for example, in the 
Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, they've actually mapped out where they have radio coverage for the park uh, specifically to assist with um, fire response in the event of wildfires. Obviously, water <laughs> becomes very, very important uh, during a fire. We've got a, it's a critical, critical piece of information and firefighters will often rely on local sources of water, especially in places like uh, these leeward areas of our islands, the drier, drier regions of our, of our islands. So, you know, making clear they know where the location of these things are, how much is there and, and what the access is like, you know, so trying to make sure that if it's a reservoir that they can get to the edge of it if they need to fill up tankers. Um, reservoirs often have linings that might preclude the use of helicopter dip uh, helicopter dips for the bucket work. Um, and you, be, you can also make improvements like deepening ditches or streams to improve access. Um, there was a case here on Oahu where uh, one of these agricultural producers was actually um, had this anti-fouling agent in the water in the, in the reservoir and so the fire uh, responders didn't want to use it to start dumping it on the <laughs> on the forest so if there's any kind of treatment being done that might be good good information to present pump and hose availability and then really important is the the fittings um, on water tanks so getting in touch with your fire responders your local agencies to understand what kind of fittings they're using and, and making sure that you have compatible fittings for your for your fire for your water tanks. Site access too is often something that's really critically important but can be overlooked. Um, so just allowing safe entry and exit is one of the really the most basic things that firefighters are looking for when they're coming onto a site, they're not going to enter your land management unit if they don't feel that they can get their vehicles and people out in and out safely. And so, you know, keeping things in mind like road width and turnarounds. Uh, and again, in, in the guide, we actually have a diagram showing uh, the required turnarounds uh, for, for fire vehicles. Um, you can indicate on your plans whether how, how well maintained roads are, uh, if it's four wheel drive access only, um, if there are seasonal issues with when they get wet. Um, again, as far as really basic improvements is just marking where your access points are. Can they even find the site and get to it? Um, things like weight restrictions on bridges. Again, this is all the kind of information that you, you're, you want these firefighters to know how best and how easily it is to get onto scene. So uh, fences, lock gates, and other obstacles. Uh, I know, for example, up on Palihua here on Oahu that the, the land managers up there basically have a list of combinations for their all their gates that the firefighters have and they make sure that they know what those combinations are if they change. Uh, and another thing that's often overlooked but I think is important for our land managers to kind of anticipate that fire suppression is going to have impacts. Um, you know we're talking about a pretty uh, complex operations that can happen so staging areas where you know the crews are organizing each morning to sort of uh, plan what they're going to do. You're going to have a lot of vehicles coming in and out, um, potential use of bulldozers, helicopter landing zones and it, it's really going to be on you as a land manager to um, make it clear which places are okay for these kinds of operations and which places are, are sort of no-go zones. So again, as an example here on Oahu, um, there's a bunch of sites in Waianae Kai where there's a lots and lots of archaeological sites and they know, the uh, state firefighters know that they cannot use bulldozers in some of those areas to cut line. Um, and so again, this is the kind of information that you as a land manager are going to know about and if you can anticipate what this operation is going to look like, uh, you can be proactive um, in order to, to sort of reduce the, the impacts of that, the suppression operations. And kind of the end product, so this is really about what, what it should look like. Um, and in this, the, here's the like just sort of the top line of the the publication there on the on the left hand side. Um, in in the back of that, we actually have a template 
for the narrative description. And uh, this is sort of just compiled from different plans that we, we looked at. Um, and so this, again, sort of provides the details. And they don't have to be, it doesn't have to be a novel or anything, but it, it, it's a set of items that you want to consider um, and a way to present that information. Of course, not all of these um, items that we're talking about today will be relevant. Eating this narrative plan where you can kind of have the notification, who needs to be informed, procedures for once a fire is happening. Um, you want to be able to communicate the locations of a lot of these resources and assets to the firefighters quickly. Um, and so maps become really critical and they can range from hand-drawn maps, topo maps. Again, these are just examples that I put in this um, guide and pulled right out of there. Um, again, indicating where structures are, hazards, um, water resources, any of the assets that you are concerned about protecting as a land manager and any resources that can help firefighters better respond uh, in the event of an incident. Um, a number of land managers here in Hawaii, especially on Oahu, given our complex topography, have gone away from topo maps and actually used three-dimensional um, Google Earth images. And Google Earth, if you haven't played around with it, it's really easy um, and kind of fun to play with too. And you can lo mark locations of critical habitat, for example, or other resources. You can actually use polygons to, to sort of chart out areas that are high priority areas. And what um, this is primarily the uh, Oahu Army Natural Resource Program has found that when they're at an incident, especially when there's helicopter operations and things like uh, going on like that, is that they have a series of these maps um, printed out from Google Earth in large format. And it, they just found that it's much easier to interpret for um, in the events uh, of an incident than looking at topo maps that you kind of have this perspective looking up at the management unit and they can uh, quickly identify and, and communicate where their priority areas are to uh, the firefighters. So just as a kind of recap this this uh, again I, I really kind of enjoy talking about pre-fire plans because it really highlights the importance of local knowledge. Um, and I think a lot of this information is probably already in, in folks' heads when it comes to you know, their understanding of, of the resources that they're managing. Um, it's sort of just a matter of compiling it and then knowing the plan and how to best make that information uh, accessible. And again, here's that link to we'll share with the relevant response agencies. You know, these guys are going to be your best friends if a fire happens. And it, it's really, however, on you to um, communicate what your priorities are in the event of a fire. I mean, their jobs are to put the fire out, to protect lives and, and property. But you know, you will have knowledge that can make their jobs much more effective in the event of a fire. And with that, it's telling me I have one more slide here. but. Um, so please check out our, our website. You can find this information. Again, that guide is posted there uh, under our resources uh, and publications. And if you have any questions and you want um, help either developing or reviewing fire plans for your, your management units, I'm available. And my contact information is there uh, at the bottom. And so with that, um, yeah, here again, this is our research and publications page here in this last slide uh, with the link there to that guide. But I will turn it over to the group here uh, to see if there are any questions. Okay. 
Okay, so first uh, I'm going to say, so Rodney's asking here, um, last year we had a presentation at the Seafarers Training Facility at Kaleloa. Uh, Honolulu Fire Department and Fed Fire were there. Are we going to have another meeting uh, to include, including this kind of information? Is that the question? I think, and I, I correct me if I'm wrong, Ronnie, but I think you might be referring to the um, the community wildfire protection plan meeting that we had last year, um, and that was an effort by Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization to develop a community wildfire protection plan for West Oahu. Um, at the moment, we don't really have plans or follow. Okay, yeah. So we don't have plans um, to follow up directly with um, sort of directly related to that plan, but the plan will be released in the next month or so. And what will be cool about that plan is it will be available for everyone to check out. And it, the community meetings that we will facilitate for that uh, really help, try to identify um, ways to reduce fire risk, so community input on concerns and then solutions to address those concerns. Um, but uh, so there's no plan follow-up for that specifically. Um, and Elliot Parsons, how, how are you doing, Elliot? Said, I'm wondering about technical guidelines for establishing safety zones. So. Yes, there are technical guidelines for establishing safety zones, um, and this has come out of the Missoula Fire Lab. They just released
can go. So So Elliot's Alex like from the National Weather Service. So we have links on the Pacific Fire Exchange to those what products. What does that actually um, look like once you have your plan? Right. And so the, the, he's asking about sort of thresholds like for relative humidity. Um, folks. It's a really good question. Um, but really briefly, we've got cutoffs that define red flag warnings for Hawaii State. Um, and it's basically 45% relative humidity, anything below that, and a wind speeds uh, above 20 miles an hour for two hours or longer. So the combination of those two factors, along with a high KBDI, is how we issue red flags. The limitations right now is that those factors are only monitored at the Honolulu airport. Um, and that is something we're working on, um, but it's a discussion for another webinar. Any other questions? Sure. Yeah, that's a, an excellent question. Um, so the process isn't really anything formalized. Um, it's really about going to, so nine times out of 10, it's going to be the county fire departments that respond to fires. They are, by and large, the first to respond. Um, and a lot, many of the land areas that we're dealing with in Hawaii, their jurisdiction zone will fall within the county fire department. Uh, in those circumstances, um, the best approach is to really go down to your local fire department, try to set up a meeting with the battalion chief. Um, and and I think what we've been talking about with, for example, with some of the watershed coordinators is, is working um, to get the firefighters out to the land uh, so that they can actually see these areas and understand the, the needs that you have. But th I think the first step is really just going to them uh, directly and saying, you know, here is this land area. I'm worried about fire risk. Here are the resources that I'm concerned with. Um, and what that really will do is start the conversation and it will allow them to see how you're organizing your information um, and you'll be able to get feedback on what might make things easier for them, um, suggestions and input as far as maybe potential improvements. Um, but one of the, again, I, I gave a little brief version of this in December um, to with, with the Hawaii Watershed Partnership Coordinators. And one of the things that came out of that was uh, the need to really get firefighters engaged with their programs and aware of their programs and, and try to develop opportunities to bring them out on the land um, so that they can see these, these uh, resources firsthand. Um, and before anyone actually signs out, hey, can you, uh, Melissa, share the link? So we've div we have a, like a little evaluation survey. I just want to, before people take off here, can you just share that link in the chat window? So we really uh, encourage your input and feedback. If you guys can take, it'll take you like less than five minutes. Um, Melissa is going to put up a link for a little uh, survey we've designed just to get feedback on how the webinar went and what you liked and what you didn't like. That's, and in the meantime, Donna, please shoot your question. You can speak. I think you all have microphone access or chat, whatever you prefer.
And there's the link in the chat window. The link just popped up. No worries, Donna. Oh, wow, OK. So Donna is from Kahiki Nui, where um, some of you may be aware, a big fire. Um, yeah. What is it? Not quite 6,000 acres, but somewhere up in there. One of the biggest we've had in a long time. Yeah. Okay, so they're surrounded by goats. I'm assuming feral goats, not like a managed herd. Okay, so former ranching. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, one of the biggest issues we're facing across the state. Yep is the sort of what once was ranching lands are largely kind of lying fallow and unmanaged. Right. Are there so right funding sources to try to uh, okay yep I'm actually really glad you brought this up Donna um, so she's wanting to know if there's funding for fencing. Um, and potentially using goats or other livestock potentially to for fuels reduction. I think that's what you're. If I'm, pardon me for jumping ahead of the chat window. Not cattle. So, two points I think that you bring up with your question here um, is so a lot of these dry areas. Um, there's this issue with native forests or forests in general being compatible with um, ungulates that were all introduced here and uh, in a lot of areas are just sort of on un unmanaged ungulates or wild goats things like that um, and so the, the sort of the big contentious issue here is that we uh, from a conservation perspective the the action is we remove these feral ungulates in order for the forest to thrive um, but in these drier areas especially what that does is it increases fuel loads. And that's documented. There's not really much question about that. Um, uh, the problem is not so much with um, you know, feral ungulates uh, being, uh, how should I say this? It's, it's more, uh, there's a big difference. There's an important difference between managed ungulates and unmanaged ungulates, or managed grazing and unmanaged grazing. So if we do this well, um, and as Donna pointed out, you fence the right areas uh, and you manage these ungulates um, carefully, they can be used as a tool to reduce uh, fuel loads. And there's a lot of discussion amongst folks in Hawaii, given the sheer size of the landscapes that we're dealing with. Um, so when we look statewide, this, these non-native grasslands, um, which are our bigger, biggest fire problem, they cover about a quarter state land area. So it's like a million acres. So giant, giant landscape issue here. Um, but the, the, the challenge is really, how do we do that um, responsibly, uh, both from the perspective of the animals as well as the risk? So Donna says, yeah, creating a buffer around the homestead area. Um, 
and I think this is a great idea. The next question is, so we, you can use ungulates as a tool for reducing fuel loads, especially in these areas that are already just dominated by non-native species, um, non-native plants, I should say, like grasses, these non-native grasses. Um, the funding question, uh, we should talk because I've been in conversation with Leeward Haleakala Watershed Partnership. This manages the lands Malka of you guys. And there is a funding opportunity. Um, it's the U.S. Forest Service WUI grant. WUI stands for Wildland Urban Interface. Um, and so these grants are there to support exactly these kinds of activities, to reduce wildfire impacts on um, homes, neighborhoods, communities, as well as the resources that, that, that we value. Um, and so please get in touch with me. My email is right there on the, on the screen. Um, I'm planning a trip to Maui in July, uh, but I think that we'll, we may try to do a field trip before that, actually out to that fire, and talk about potential partnerships and, and putting in an application for, for a grant, a WUI grant to do um, and maintain um, these fuels reductions uh, around Kahikinui in particular. So for, and for anyone else who's interested in these WUI grants, um, the haven't announced them yet, but the, uh, I think they will be due in around June, and I'm working with DOFA, Division of Forest and Wildlife, here to increase the number of applications that we have. Um, in the state, we're allowed to submit 10 each year, and we fall far short of that each year. And so part of the effort to demonstrate to the federal government that we have a fire issue here is going to be increasing the number of um, applications we put in. So if anyone else is interested, let me know. Um, there is the grants, the WUI, and it's uh, WI. Um, the grants have not been announced yet. Um, and when they are announced, we will put it up on the Pacific Fire Exchange website, and I'll make sure to link up with Pablo at Hawaii Wildfire, so it will be put up there. And, and again, Hawaii Wildfire, Pablo's here with the room for us. They're another excellent resource to, to, to get involved in talking about this stuff, too. Um, and that here, it's a, yeah. U.S. Forest Service. Um, Elliot asked if there's a fire plan for a place in Hawaii that I would recommend as a model. Um, it's funny you say that. I just had Cheyenne Perry um, with the Mauna Kea Watershed Alliance send me his uh, just the other week. I haven't had a chance to look at it. I gave an example in that guide of one that was for, from the mainland that I thought was pretty relevant. Um, and But at the moment, I, I haven't looked closely enough for Cheyenne, and I also haven't got permission from him to share it. <laughs> but uh, we will... Uh, if he allows me to, I will post that on the same link where the guide is to, to give a Hawaii-specific example. Right now, we just have a link to one that was developed for the mainland that I, right, think, is, okay? I think is relevant. I think you, you, it, it, I, it I will can. work as, uh, a, as a I got my mic to work. <laughs> I, I wanted to chime in just a little earlier. Um, uh, Donna, it looks like Donna's still there. but um, Edith said uh, it would be great if you could send grant announcements to folks up. attending um, this webinar if possible. Just yeah, this last well, year or that so, is we possible. Um, a, sign uh, up to our list a serve. That's the other thing I should remind you of. Uh, if you go on our website, um, pfx.com, you can find out more information. There um, is a. Gosh, I don't know if I can. If I have so it on one of these there's pages. certainly uh, you can um, that direction here. Enter your uh, email and it will sign you up to our, our listserv that we like manage for MailChimp. And once those and, become uh, announced, we will make sure that the word gets out both through Wildfire and the Pacific um, Fire Exchange. Around that area. We can also um, work with uh, um, 
we're in conversations with Andrea <clears throat> Buckman as well um, from the Watershed Partnership there. And Funding sources to develop to fire kind of plans. Good question. Where we can um, kind of sit down and. Uh, you know, even you know, the the WUI grants the could be a potential plan, source. The, it's a pretty wide the range the of applications. Updated, what I they really want to see is targeted fire risk more. reduction. Um, um, so our last meeting that we had with the program survival, manager for the um, Forest Service Fire and Aviation and Management we, said yeah, that they can, typically we, focus we can, on sort of straightforward reductions. So how many acres did you treat, for example, which makes, I think, Donna's example uh, really relevant. For, but they've for also CWPP been used to fund well things like developing plans and, and, and steps, mitigation and that's we sort can of planning. Discuss further, um, Donna. Uh, we're but I think at what Elliot brings up is a, a it's a big issue here. It's you know how do we get uh, the resources and uh, devote sufficient the resources to these things before the fire happens, to, and that's really that. the so, spot that we're in um, nationwide. Is maybe I can just we don't drop my have enough resources devoted the to the front end of fire management. It all tends to get dumped into just the reaction, which is the response. That's it on my end. Oh, Thank Pablo, you. do you have your hand up? I'm sorry. Pablo, do you have a question? And good job, guys. I, I can.